Um, anyway, so uh, CAT 911 is community action teams that are trying to build alternatives uh, to 911 in Southern California. And if you are interested in becoming part of our efforts, I'm going to send a little, and you'd like to be on our listserv, I'm going to send a little link that you can add your email listserv a little bit later on, and also post information on how you can follow our work. And uh, today we're very excited to have Elliot Sukui, who has been organizing around disability justice and abolition uh, for a very long time, and I think we'll be providing us important information we all need to know in terms of thinking about how we do abolitionist politics in a way that can unintendedly uh, replicate carceral shenanigans uh, that target people with disabilities. So this will be very helpful uh, work that we can do to make sure we have a consistent abolitionist politics as we go forward, particularly in this very momentous time that we have now. Um, so with that, Without further ado, let us turn it over to Elliot. Yeah. You're and on. I had to find the unmute oh. button. That was a struggle. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. And thank you all so much for taking time out of what is some big banana grams times that we're in uh, to join us for this conversation today. Um, so again, my name is Elliot Fukui. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and today, yeah, we're just going to talk about some of the ways that we think about how we're messaging as we're really in this super critical, deeply painful and simultaneously beautiful moment where we're actually seeing abolition coming to fruition a little bit on the horizon, right? We're in this tangible moment where we can, we can feel this happening. And we just wanna be cautious about the messaging um, and what we're asking for and seeking in terms of alternatives, right? To prisons and jails. So I do wanna start by taking just a moment for us to just get grounded here together. Um, Thank you for being here and thank you for and surviving whatever you survived, right, to join this space today. Um, I also want to take a moment to just honor um, the exhaustion and the grief and the pain of this moment um, and to reground in our commitment for liberation and particularly for the liberation of Black lives and to ending cages and policing in our lifetimes and for our shared struggle to the world that we all deserve right now. I would also like to take a moment to say their names and honor the memory of George Floyd, Nina Pop, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Aubrey, and the countless other lives that we have lost to the agents of white supremacy and anti-blackness. I also want to make very clear, and I always like to say this, is um, my work is a continuation, right, of a lineage and legacy of brilliant work that has been led by so many different organizers, movement folks, educators um, across the world. And so I would just like to take a moment to particularly lift up the Fireweed Collective, formerly the Icarus Project, the Mad Pride Movement, the Ex-Patient Movement, the Mental Patients Liberation Front, the work of Leah Lakshmi, and every psychiatric survivor who has ever had the courage to speak their truth. And I also want to take a moment to honor the memory of Stacey Park Milburn, whose work deeply influenced my own, and who is forever loved, and who is deeply missed, and particularly in this moment. My little button pushers aren't working. Uh, so just a quick access note. I'm always open to feedback on how to create accessible materials and trainings. Um, so if at any point you need me to change speed, volume, or provide more explanation, please let us know in the chat. And I wanna thank the amazing folks who are working very hard today to make this webinar accessible. So thank you. Oh, that's me again. Hey. Okay. So my name's Elliot. I use he, him pronouns and I identify as a mad, 
queer and trans Nike, which is a Japanese term for first generation. Um, Hafu, another Japanese term for half, or so I'm half Japanese and half white. Um, survivor. And I've been an organizer and a facilitator and a trainer uh, for almost 20 years now. And I've been super privileged to have been able to organize across the country with a whole bunch of really amazing different folks over the years. Um, but primarily, my work has been centered in queer and trans and gender nonconforming BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, I want to take a to offer that our presentation today or what I'm going to be talking about today um, is going to be difficult for folks. Um, I will be talking about psychiatric institutionalization and psychiatric medicine. Um, this will include talking about themes of abuse, violence, neglect, sexual violence, policing, and institutional violence. And I just want to remind folks that if any point you feel yourself getting triggered or feeling yourself tightening up or getting floaty, um, these are kind of my five go-tos when I'm, when I'm starting to feel my, my anxiety kicking up or feeling myself moving triggered. And it's just something I share at the beginning of every workshop. Um, try and drink some water. I have a big jug right here. I hope you have one too. Um, try and find some part of you that you can center in, right? Um, sometimes for me, that's just imagining balls of light floating through my body or paying attention to just my pinky or something like that. Doing a body scan or moving or wiggling around. Uh, I tend to do that a lot. Reaching out. So if you know we're going to be talking about difficult content, now would be a great time to text a comrade and say that you're going to be talking about some heavy things and you want to see if someone's around to talk about that with you later. And extending loving patience to ourselves and to each other. Uh, for a lot of us, this may be new. For some of us, this may be our lived experiences. And so we just want to remember to offer that love and support and care to one another as we're going through this material. Okay, so our rundown is we're going to firstly start with a brief history of psychiatric medicine, just because I know this is not something that many of us are taught, um, in, at least in any public education setting. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that is, um, how this history has led us to where we are today in terms of psychiatry and psychiatric institutionalization. Um, we're going to take a little break for five minutes so folks can pee, take a drag off a smoke, do what you gotta do to take care of yourself. Um, and then we'll move into some more solutions-based um, and some practice-based ideas uh, for how we can think about supporting comrades who um, are neurodivergent or neuroatypical or cognitively disabled um, instead of dialing 911. Um, and then we will have a little room for questions and answers and then we're gonna have our close out. Um, and please feel free to type. I am not someone who can read the chat box while I'm speaking, um, but please, please do type your questions in. And I hope that, you know, um, hopefully with your support team that um, I can make sure to get to them. Um, oh no, my image isn't working. Sorry, y'all. This slide deck. So I wanted to start with the sort of early, early beginning context of where psychiatry and particularly institutionalization, right, the use of asylums or forced um, institutionalization became practice um, in the United States. So I'm not going to get like super deep into it because psychiatry is a really complicated, big, long, messy ball of history, right? Um, but I want to really focus in on some of the critical moments um, that may help us think about the relationships between incarceration and policing and psychiatry and pathologization. So in 1752, way back in the day, 
The Quakers were the first to provide a space to treat the insane or lunatics in the United States. So this was in a Philadelphia hospital actually, and rooms in the basement with built-in shackles were used. Um, Quakers were also the first to use solitary confinement and the beginning of what we now call supermax prisons in 1829, right? And that building, that, that penitentiary actually still exists in Philadelphia today. Um, both prisons and asylums were heavily driven by religious doctrine and pseudoscience, right? And sometimes straight up quack science, um, which justified essentially torture and dehumanization of millions of people, right? So the, the things that came out of this era or things that were considered treatment uh, during this time pe period were things like solitary confinement, um, bleeding or using leeches, forced sterilization, forced labor, labor, private and public interrogations, cold showers or cold baths for sometimes hours at a time, um, corporal punishment, and servitude of patient to physicians. Um, and this was pretty much the standard and the norm in many asylums, right, and hospitals uh, throughout the early 1800s and into the 1900s. I also think that it's critical for us to note that we see a massive increase for the need for asylums in the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, right? So we're looking at like the 1800s um, because asylums in the 1820s, right? Average around 57 patients per asylum. Uh, once we get to the 1870s, right? Which is when we're really in the swing of the Industrial Revolution in the beginning of this, that number rose to an average of 473 uh, people per asylum. Um, we also want to pay attention to the other historical things that are happening during this time, right? Urbanization, uh, Jim Crow, there are a whole mess of other things that are happening at this time. And so every time we're thinking about increase in numbers, I think we frequently go to urbanization or mass movement of population. But I also want us to think about what wars were happening. Um, what were the context and conditions of laborers, of women, um, of children on the ground during these time periods. In, and I wanted to lift up like examples of how psych psychiatry has actually been used um, to justify, right, the sort of deeply racist and misogynistic um, sort of logics that we see throughout a lot of our culture and our communities. Um, so in 1851, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who was a eugenicist quack in Louisiana, um, created two diagnoses that were specific to enslaved Africans, which was drapetomania or the disease that causing enslaved people to run away and dysesthesia ethiopica, which who can even say that, um, which proposed a theory for the cause of laziness amongst enslaved Africans. I didn't even have words when, when I first discovered these diagnoses um, and that these were actually utilized. Um, and treatment for these, of course, and I say treatment because that's what they called it, were corporal punishment, right? Um, so looking at how this system is actually a front runner and part of the ways that we have been able to criminalize black folks is through the way that these pseudosciences and these sort of pathologizing or you know making something about how someone thinks or who they are uh, into some sort of disorder. The fact that 
people resisting their oppression is seen as disordered within the mainstream psychiatric movement during this time period um, should be a sort of an alarm bell to what we're how this system has formed over over the the past couple hundred years i also wanted to raise up another important piece which is the the ugly laws um, the ugly laws were in effect in both Europe and the United States, um, and those laws extended from between 1867 until 1974 in some places. And essentially, ugly laws made it illegal for disabled people to be in public. And it was worded in the language of any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or deformed in any way so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object to expose himself or herself to public view. Again, when we're thinking about how institutionalization began, we cannot remove, right? We cannot say that this is all, there were mad people that nobody knew what to do with any of them. Right, we have, to look at, we have to look at how psychiatry was actually used to justify keeping people inside. A big reason the ugly laws came to pass is because so many people during that time period were struggling with the advice from institutions and laws that said that um, paupers and disabled people, uh, you shouldn't actually give them material goods or help them, you should try counseling them. And um, you, sh you should try interrogating them. And this actually created so much guilt because the cr this went against Christian doctrine of helping thy neighbor, right? Uh, that the obvious solution was to just put disabled people away so that we didn't make able-bodied people and abled people feel bad uh, for our state of existence. And I, again, this, this is not that long ago. 1974 is not that long ago. So I, I just want us to keep in mind, right, how long these things lasted for. Um, I'm going to read a quote uh, that comes from a psychiatrist um, named Judy Lewis Herman, who is known for her work with sexual abuse survivors, talking about Freud and how he tried to discover the root of hysteria. This slide may be triggering to folks because it does pertain to childhood sexual abuse. So I advise folks to please deep, breathe deeply, drink some water, and if you feel like you need to move away during this time period, that is completely okay. And I support you in making that decision to take care of yourself. It was Freud's ambition to discover the cause of hysteria, the archetypal female neurosis of his time. In his early investigations, he gained the trust and confidence of many women who revealed their troubles to him. Time after time, Freud's patients, women from prosperous conventional families, unburdened painful memories of childhood sexual encounters with men they had trusted, family, friends, relatives, and fathers. Freud initially believed his patients and recognized the significance of their confessions. At the origin of every case of hysteria, Freud asserted was a childhood sexual trauma. But Freud was never comfortable with this discovery because of what it implied about the behavior of respectable family men. If his patients' reports were true, incest was not a rare abuse, confined to the poor and the mentally defective, but was endemic to the patriarchal family. Recognizing the implicit challenge to patriarchal values, Freud refused to identify fathers publicly as sexual aggressors. Though in his private correspondence, he cited, by, he cited seduction by the father 
as the essential point in hysteria. He was never able to bring himself to make this statement in public. And that is from Judy Lewis Herman. So I wanna take a, a pause because I know that's a lot to take in. That literally young girls and young women surviving abuse at the hands of people and members of their family uh, was pathologized and made into hysteria. And that even with full knowledge of what was impacting these survivors, Freud chose to protect the patriarchy and the wealth and the upper class men uh, who were paying his checks. Psychiatry was specifically and very much so targeted and weaponized against women. Um, queer folks and trans folks as well. So we have literally been pathologizing how people have survived violence and removing them, right? And during the 1800s and up until the 1900s, up until the 80s, it was incredible. Hysteria was a diagnosis until 1980. It was incredibly easy for families to put young women and young girls away in psychiatric institutions because of hysteria. And I want us to think about, again, what, what does it mean to be mad? What does it mean to be neurodivergent? And what does it mean to receive diagnoses from institutions who are built to uphold the status quo and to remove right, um, anything that could make neurotypical or abled people feel uncomfortable? When we move into the 1900s, right, uh, in 1950, we have the, ad, the invention of Thorazine. Uh, Thorazine is one of the first antipsychotic, it is the first antipsychotic drug that's invented, um, which enables the, mood, the move towards deinstitutionalization, which we're gonna see more in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. But I want to note again, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that happens in the 1930s through the 1940s, where we again see an uptick and increase of people's need for asylums. In fact, in the 1940s and 50s, um, hospitalization usage increased by 900%. Now, again, I want us to think about what was happening politically and socially and culturally during that time period uh, between the 1930s to the 1950s, where we have wars, where we have a Great Depression, and where we have Jim Crow laws and other means of suppression happening against communities, right? Marginalized communities already and most impacted communities. And during this time is when we also begin to see the, the language of eugenics really coming into play and being used as another means to justify the long-term um, incarceration of folks with disabilities. And I put up another couple of dates because again, this is not that long ago in our history, right? And actually there are still hospitals and psychiatric facilities that are being shut down today for abuse and for neglect and for a lot of the same reasons that we saw in the initial founding of what psychiatry was in the late 1700s. Thank you for your patience with me. It's been a, I'm, I'm fuzzy and I'm, I'm trying to get into it. Um, this history is the root of psychiatry. It's the root of how psychiatry has been practiced 
and is weaponized against people with disabilities. Over half of the people who are murdered by police are people with disabilities. And I understand wanting to keep people with disabilities safe. However, I want to name that in the conversations and in the policies and in the call outs, um, very rarely do we get to see or hear the voices of folks who have actually been impacted by these systems. Um, and so I want us, as we're moving forward, right, we're going to keep this history in mind. But beyond the history, I want us to really think about um, what the human impact is for a child to be raised in unsanitary conditions uh, without receiving affection or touch, uh, being restrained constantly, being drugged forcibly, right? Um, these are still the practices that are happening in psychiatric facilities. And so when we think about what the core of the abolition is, right, what the call for self-determination is, I just am here to remind folks um, as a disabled person that we are people and that we should have a say in what happens to our bodies. And we're gonna talk about that and what that's been looking like um, a little bit more through the lens of not psychiatry, but disability justice. And here's another note that I wanna make um, before I move on, just so folks are clear. I'm not here to tell anybody not to take meds. I'm not here to tell anybody not to access a resource if that is the resource that works for you. What I wanna talk about is why we still accept unconsensual forced detainment of certain members of our community when we're also resisting that same thing with other members of our community and how we didn't have the solutions, uh, we still don't, right? We don't have the answer for what comes after prisons and jails. We're building it as we go along. And in the same way, we need to think about disability justice and emotional healing and healing justice as being frameworks from which we can begin to design community responses to emotional crisis. Here's um, from a very small survey that came out of Mad in America, which I highly recommend checking out. Um, is, and this is a survey of people who have done time in psychiatric facilities. More than half of the respondents described their psychiatric ward experience as traumatic. 37% said they were physically abused in some way with forced treatment included as an example of physical abuse and a reminder that forced treatment still today includes forced medication, uh, which includes shots and can also include forced electroshock therapy. 7% of people who have been in psychiatric wards reported that they were sexually abused. Only 27% of people said they felt safe and secure while on a psych ward. And only 17% said they were satisfied with the quality of the psychiatric treatment they received. Now, if psych wards were like, you know, on Yelp, none of these things are reviews that are like, hell yeah, let's all go to the psych ward, right? Like 17% of us felt satisfied with the quality of psychiatric treatment that we received. If this isn't working, for disabled people, then it's not gonna work. If forced institutionalization, 5150 holds, do not work, okay? And we have the data because if you talk to most mad folks, we will all tell you it doesn't work. However, policy decisions, again, and decisions about our well being are being made without us right, calls for more psychiatric facilities um, coming from abolitionists 
feels incredibly difficult for me sometimes. Coming to, okay, so I want to give us a little more framing in ways, well, firstly, it's 630. So actually, because I'm feeling a little bit, ha, ah, also, um, if we can go ahead and take our five minute break now, that would be deeply appreciated on my part. And if uh, I will go ahead and get started again in five minutes, um, I just am feeling a little loopy and want to make sure that I'm staying present with you all. Uh, so thank you so much for your understanding. And we're going to come back at 635 and we'll continue on our journey together then. forms and put your email address in there so that we can add you to the mailing list. And if you have any questions, I think you can see on the chat to email Jessica or Ellie and she, they will kind of collect the questions together to help facilitate discussion at the end. And also near the end, um, we'll be uh, putting on the chat line the handouts that you're seeing now from Elliot so that you can uh, download them at the end of this presentation. So I'll upload those during the Q&A that happens during the last 15 minutes. And for folks who just joined in, we'll be resuming in about one or two minutes. We're just taking a little break. Hi friends, thank you so much for your understanding and for letting me take a little break. Um, this, is, this is an incredibly personal issue to me. Um, and even though I've been doing this work for a very long time in this, in this current political moment, um, obviously it's, it's been getting harder and harder. Um, so normally at this point, is where I, I talk about how I, I came to this work um, because I, I think that it is important um, for us to speak truth to power. And it is, still, it is still difficult even after all these years. And so um, for other survivors too who experienced this and just, yeah, um, grateful that I've had so many amazing models of speaking truth to power. Um, so I, I came to this work, uh, when I was 15 years old and I discovered, uh, what was then the Icarus project and what is now Fireweed Collective. Um, and this was back in the early 2000s. Um, and I arrived at the Icarus project page, um, because I was looking for some way to survive uh, outside of the system. And I entered psychiatric facilities for the first time when I was 12 years old. 
uh, and I had attempted suicide. And from that first hospitalization until I was 16 years old, uh, I spent the majority of my time in psychiatric facilities, day treatment programs, special education programs. Um, and during that time, I was also placed on 13 different medications, uh, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anti anti-hallucinogens, sleep aids, sedatives, um, everything from lithium to geodin to trazodone to clonopin. Um, and what, what feels hard too is I, I am someone who's experienced forced restraint and forced medi medicating, uh, which is abusive. Um, so I say all of this to you because I know that sometimes, and particularly when we look at just how bananagrams and ridiculous psychiatry was historically, um, is that the effects of this are still happening. There are actually still psych wards that are being shut down um, across this country who, because there's finally documentation of abuses um, that have been occurring. We have a long way to go, right? But I found Fire Week Collective. I went non-med compliant. It took me three more years before I was completely out of the system and I didn't go back. I did do some time in adult wards as well. Um, and I was able to do that because of the frameworks that were offered to me from by other disabled people who were finding solutions outside of systems to survive. And the frameworks that really impacted me and made it possible for me to take the steps I needed to um, to get out of the system were disability justice and then later on healing justice. Um, and I wanted to offer this quote by, quote by Patty Byrne from Sins Invalid. If you're not familiar with their work, please check them out. Um, so beautiful and amazing. But this is disability justice an honoring of the long standing legacies of resilience and resistance, which are the inheritance of all of us whose bodies or minds will not conform. Disability justice is a vision and practice of a yet to be, a map that we create with our ancestors and our great grandchildren onward in the width and depth of our multiplicities and histories a movement towards a world in which everybody in mind is known as beautiful. And there's nothing to add to that, it's just like amazing. Um, and then healing justice is a framework that identifies how we can holistically respond to and intervene on generational trauma and violence and to bring collective practices that can impact and transform the consequences of oppression on our bodies, hearts, and minds. And this is a quote by Kara Page. Why I do this work, why I think many of us do this work, is because we recognize that something doesn't feel good, right? Something has been incredibly broken for a long time. Disabled people, pe communities of color, Black and Indigenous communities, right, all understand the overwhelming pain of oppression in different ways, right? And that it is very, very critical for us as people who want deep-rooted change, right, as Aurora Levins Morales offers us in this quote, um, we have to really actually face the reality of how this shows up in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, I see someone's raising a hand and I don't know how to do anything about that. I'm sorry, comrades. Um, Sorry, refocusing. Um, so in this moment, as we are amplifying, right, Black leadership and Black voices, it, it is also very critical that we lift up 
right, the voices of folks who lay at that intersection, right? And we do know that Black folks, Indigenous folks, Asian folks, Latinx folks, there are no communities that, that have not in, been impacted, right, by the ways that psychiatry and pathologization have worked, right, to support our subjugation and our oppression. Moving on to the next thing, here comes the fun part where, <laughs> where it's less about like how trash everything is and yes, everything is trash. Um, but also that there has been so much work, there's such a long lineage of work that has actually been left to us to support us in actually building and creating the alternatives that we need right now to start practicing and thinking about the alternatives to calling 911, particularly when we see someone in emotional crisis. And I'm going to talk about that through what is known in um, like many circles as mad mapping um, or safety and wellness planning, right? And how to do that from a community-based level. That could be like its own workshop for like, you know, two days or whatever. So we're gonna do like the condensed version. Um, but I also asked Andrea to go ahead and um, send um, a, a toolkit kind of guide that folks can use when they're beginning to safety plan and it already has questions and stuff in it. But we're just gonna run through some of the benefits of safety planning and wellness planning and how do we as disabled people, as people who are neurodivergent or neuroatypical or cognitively disabled, how do we take control and agency over how we want to live our lives? Um, not on the basis of the fear of abled people or the, the thought processes that have been instilled in us to make us believe that we are somehow broken or dangerous um, or unworthy but how do we create communities that can hold for someone uh, who may be experiencing emotional crisis? And how do we, we return to um, kinship and relationship as sort of the ways that we provide care for people? So obviously support and care teams look different for everybody and have different meanings. Um, what we're talking about right now is a, as a way we can start moving towards actionable steps we can take um, is a group of people who are creating and participating in a process of mutual aid that is grounded in agency and consent to support one another and prevent harm. Um, a group of people who are in alignment about communication, decision making, and their roles during times of support and crisis. This is also called proactive rapid response, right? Um, folks who are willing to try different strategies in order to minimize impact to someone who is in emotional crisis and minimize burnout for people who are in supportive roles and who are willing to practice being accountable to and for themselves and to each other and who are willing to practice resource sharing and or wealth redistribution. So a long time ago in my early 20s, um, I realized that I was, I was not going to be able to sustain myself um, working full time. Uh, I was trying to go back to school. Um, it was my third college. Um, academia was a nightmare for me, but I made it through. Um, and I realized I needed to sort of more solidly solidify the folks who had seen me through my episodic states um, and through my trigger and trauma responses. Um, and so I wrote a terrified email to um, five or six friends and everyone agreed to start working with me to figure out how we could start tracking uh, how my episodes were happening and sort of track how my triggers were happening. Um, and also so that folks could support one another um, since uh, the extent and length of my episodes can sometimes, you know, sometimes can take me like a month or two to actually be fully back and present um, and like quote unquote functional, right? 
Um, so we started this process about 12 years ago. We, I did not start that process in the middle of an active crisis. Um, and this is actually pretty important. Um, so if someone's actively in crisis right now, that's the time to just deploy crisis response. And it's not the time to start forming your team. Um, so much like any process or project or any collective thing that we've, we do together, um, it's kind of super important to have clear, realistic goals. Right, um, and so trying to start something in the middle of crisis can be a really major letdown for folks if we haven't done the sort of initial trust building uh, that's necessary. So something I, I offer to folks to practice um, is to think about scenarios where you might become emotional. Um, I also wanna name that. I know that many of us like to think that we are perfectly together and we don't have feelings, um, but shockingly, everyone is an emotional being and therefore everyone experiences emotional, emotional health. And just because you are not someone who has received a diagnosis, doesn't mean that you will not experience emotional crisis in your lifetime. Uh, in fact, most of us at some point in our life will experience an emotional crisis, right? Due to some condition or circumstance. Um, and so we can, knowing that, knowing that will happen to all of us, um, we can think about sort of what are the ways we can plan now for smaller things, right? So in the event we get there, we're already kind of establishing trust. Um, so something I do is like, for instance, my safety team knows when I'm doing workshops and things because um, I love being with my community and it's also a spoon drainer for me, right? It's something that can take a lot of energy out of me. Uh, it's very vulnerable um, for me to be talking to a bunch of strangers who I don't know about like my, my crazy. Um, and right, I am able to do this because my team knows and we offer support to, they offer support to me on days when I do things like this, right? So you might want to even first start a team that's just around a specific event or traumaversary or season to get started, right? All of us have trauma in different places in our life. For some of us, our madness might might like femifest, right, as, as something that happens um, at nighttime only. For some of us, it might be specific times of the month, right? So try building a team just around one specific thing um, and see how it goes to build trust through that. Um, another way for folks who might be feeling a little bit, um, you know, vulnerable, not about that vulnerability life, which I don't blame anybody for, um, but you want to try to start to get into the practice is also asking for support around navigating systems and institutions. Um, and this is actually something that, that me and my team do a lot together um, and not just in crisis moments. Uh, so when I have to go uh, to apply for disability, two of my teammates will always go with me um, because so much of the abuse and harm that I experienced came from psychiatrists. Uh, the fact that I need to go in get assessed and evaluated by a psychiatrist in order to receive um, the support I need to survive is actually an incredibly uh, re-traumatizing process, right? So we focus on that one day and that one thing and how we make a plan. How are we going to get through this day? What, is, what are the things we're going to do to take care of ourselves afterwards, right? Also thinking about things like right now, all of, a lot of us are resource and stable right? Um, COVID-19, a lot of things are happening all at once. A lot of us are not working, right? Even just the simple act of organizing things like potlucks or rent parties or giving circles, obviously safely and using social distancing measures um, is another way, maybe if folks aren't ready to move into the vulnerable parts of it, but a way that we can be actively showing up and, and offering support um, to folks who are, may be like, experiencing emotional crisis. Um, and Andrea, how long do we have until Q&A? I just want to make sure I'm not like... I don't know Sorry, just checking the time. Um, you have about... 20 more minutes. 
Ooh, okay, I'm gonna get through this. Um, also, thank you all for sitting and listening to me talk for like an hour. I couldn't do that for myself, so super grateful. Um, and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts after we're done with this part. So some guiding questions that I would offer folks when you're thinking about starting a safety team. And right, I say starting a safety team, I know people are really like, what do I do for this individual person right now? I, disability justice is a practice. Um, healing justice is a practice. This isn't about caping or Right, like in order for us to keep people out of psychiatric institutions and jails, we have to build strong, trusting relationships with one another so that when those feelings and emotions do arise or when someone is episodic, we know how to care for one another in that moment. Um, so I know maybe folks are feeling like, you know, this rapid response need that is totally real and I feel that this is the way that I have been able uh, <laughs> to stay off the wards and off medication um, for the past 12 years. And so I just wanted to clarify that too, because I realized that might be confusing. But some guiding questions to start with are, what are some of the barriers I face to asking for and receiving support? What does my day-to-day -day capacity look like? What are the ways that feel safest for me to ask for support? What are some of the ways I like to receive support? Um, what are the ways that I love to offer support? How do I like to give and receive feedback? What places and spaces feel safest to me when I'm not feeling well? And what are some of my personal goals for being a part of a care team or a safety team? All right. Um, for me, it was super critical that my safety team be grounded in mutual aid. I think a lot of times people think of think about um, folks as though we're not people and that we don't have anything to offer um, and that like it is an act of charity or goodness uh, to spend time with people who have disabilities. Um, and so for me, it was very, very important that, um, that it be a mutual aid process. Um, a, because it, it helps me to break down some of my own internalized ableism and some of the internalized beliefs I still have about my value being attached to productivity. Um, but I've also found that, right, when we're all lending our talents to one another, right, regardless of how, how somebody is identifying, whenever anyone's having a hard moment, uh, we have a team that's able to kind of hold for that. And it's not just to support me, right? It is actually supporting all of us. Um, so, and again, this was a 12 year process for us to get here, but like thinking about this, not just in, in the emergent sense, but in the sense of we are now at, at this sort of horizon where we need to start building out what those alternatives will be. And I, I strongly believe, and I think if we look at what research says and what data says, community support, peer support, keeping people with their, with their homes and families, if that is what is safest and what is desired, um, are some of the best ways, right, for folks to work through and move through, right, how their disabilities show up, right, and doing that it, with love and care and compassion, right, and not shame and judgment and isolation. Who are the folks that you want to have on a safety team? Um, well, the folks I have on my safety team are people with boundaries, Obviously, we're all learning our boundaries and growing in our boundaries, but finding people who are really about learning about their boundaries and setting their boundaries, super helpful for me. Um, people who I feel seen and heard by, people who bring me joy and comfort, um, people who identify as comrades, right? Uh, people who I've seen handle a crisis. Uh, we all have that one friend who we love and some of us are like de-escalators and some 
some of us are escalators, right? Um, there are always roles for escalators in every part of life. I love many escalators. Um, but you want to know that if, if you're in crisis, you're going to have someone who's going to be able to stay grounded and not escalate you. Um, because we've seen, I've experienced that firsthand a couple times. Um, people who I've struggled with, uh, and what I mean when I say people I've struggled with is, right, people who uh, think differently from me, who have different perspectives from me. Uh, that has been incredibly helpful and important to me uh, in, in developing my wellness and my safety. People who are grounded in shared principles and values uh, are fo folks who can honor consent um, people who are aware of and constantly negotiating and engaging with power dynamics. Um, people who are accessible, right? And when I say people are accessible, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean physically, right? It means people who I know um, respond, like people who uh, have always been like a source of support for me. Um, yeah, people with different skills, identities, wisdom, and lived experience, and people who are willing to take risks and learn from their mistakes. Um, I think a lot of people frequently want there to be like a one size fits all solution for, for quote unquote, like how we deal with mental illness. Um, and the reality is, everyone has mental health everyone is experiencing the world differently so your needs are going to be drastically different um, from somebody else's needs in the situation even if you have the same diagnoses um, so i always strongly encourage people because this is a big part of undoing institutional internalized institutionalization and ableism um, is that there's no right way to be mad uh, <laughs> there's no right way to be a mad person or a disabled person. Um, and so you have to find solutions that work for that person, um, not for uh, an organization or an institution. And yep. yeah. um, so to close out, because I still have a few more minutes and because I've been talking so, so much and thank you so much for listening. Um, I wanted to show a couple snippets from videos and I've gone ahead and already um, uh, written out the, the part that I want to show from each video so folks can see that. Um, and these are two of my long-term safety team, like two comrades from my safety team who are part of my care network. Kind of talking about um, what the what the benefits are of being a part of a safety team. And go. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is India. I'm a part of Elliot's safety team. And being a part of the safety team. Um, hi Joshi. Um, <laughs> being a part of the safety team has uh, changed the way in which I think I feel empowered to be able to provide care um, for my friends and um, for my friends when they're in crisis and just like makes me feel like I can navigate that and that um, not only I can do it but like everyone can navigate that which I think that I was definitely taught that that was not something that I could do um, and that that was something for like, the medical establishment to do um, so that's been really powerful to learn and to experience and to be able to do and also um, to know that I can do it like that me doing that is going to be so much better than like the medical establishment or like a psychiatric ward um, usually so that's pretty hi hi thanks so much for doing this yeah <laughs> so what I wanted to ask you Typically, I've gotten to build community um, with other people on the safety team, and we do, it became very important early on, even though, like, a lot, some of the people on the safety team I've already known and had different types of relationships with, like, as a comrade, as a, as, you know, extended community members spread out across the country, um, but it became really important early on for us to figure out what we all needed from each other and to do that, like pushing ourselves to like move forward and like step towards each other and build relationships and care with each other, not just in those times of crisis, but like 
well, who are you and how are you and what do you need in order for this work to be something that's like sustainable and also gives us energy. I love my comrades. Um, right, so safety planning is basically having a wellness team is a way for us to sort of practice moving back into formations uh, that really exemplify what we already know, which has been messaged to us time and time again, right, is that we keep ourselves safe. The police do not keep us safe. Psychiatric facilities do not keep us safe, right? Um, and that's true for everybody. Um, so when we're thinking about, and I just have a few more minutes, so I'll just touch on a couple more things um, before we get into Q&A, because I really want to hear your thoughts. Um, but thinking about like how you can have formations and roles, uh, which can make people feel a little bit more grounded when we're responding in times of crisis or something emergent or urgent comes up, right? Um, so on my team, we have one person who's an internal communicator. So this is one person who communicates, uh, coordinates the communication amongst the whole team. Uh, my team now, it has fluctuated in size over the years. Right now, I have 12 people on my support team, uh, and that's nationally, right? So my internal communicator will touch base. All I have to do is send a text message that's like, help, you know, or not well. and they will go ahead and get in touch with the team and then figure out who has capacity to hold what in that moment. We then have folks who are external communicators. Uh, these are the folks who communicate with my employers, um, if I'm in school, right, or if I'm go supposed to be going on a date or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so we know that there's a clear role uh, and what has happened for me is um, because I'm, I have dissociative identity disorder, um, I lose time pretty frequently, right? All these chunks of time, which is really difficult to survive in a capitalist society um, because time is a struggle for me and because I don't always have control over um, my body, right? In that way to be able to show up like that. Um, and so external communicators have helped me save my job uh, in times where it was very realistic that I could lose a job. Um, and I know that is a very real fact for many, many disabled people, right? Um, so it's really important to also think about who, uh, who else needs to be communicated with because safety is a lot of different fronts. <laughs> it's economic, medical, spiritual, social, right? Um, I also have three people who are power of attorney or proxies for me. Um, so these are the folks who make decisions for me in the case that there's an emergency. Uh, this was very, very important to me uh, that I had people who I know would respect um, my desires and wishes uh, as, a, as a psychiatric survivor, um, as, a, as an abuse survivor, um, and also because I still struggle, right, with medical, going to the doctor and things like that. So having people who can support me, but I made that decision. It's not a conservatorship. Um, I made that decision and I selected the three people who I trusted to make decisions for me if I was ever to a point where I couldn't make that decision. Um, then we have support, like, Folks who just know how to show up, folks who want to just send a Netflix video, folks who want to make lunch and drop it off, um, folks who want to come and hang out and smoke a cigarette, right? Um, then I have advocates, right? These are the folks who attend appointments, support with navigating systems and institutions, and then logistics, right? So that's the person who agrees to coordinate scheduling, food deliveries, finances, et cetera. Um, my team is structured in such a way that people move in and move out based on, you know, what their spoons and capacity are. Um, and because my team is so big, and I know it's probably terrifying to think, oh my God, I'm gonna tell more than like two people about how crazy I am and what my lived experience is, uh, for those of you who are also survivors. Um, yes, it's, it was definitely intimidating, um, but again, because I have such a wide network, um, and also because my network is, um, national, that there's very rarely a time where someone can't, at the very least, pick up the phone and have a conversation with me or get on FaceTime with me, 
right? Um, what I find frequently happens is that people will maybe put trust in one or two people. Uh, those folks eventually burn out, right? And right, I have experienced that personally too in my younger life. So we really want to think about, again, how are we extending a network a, a building a community where this is the culture of how we show up for one another. Uh, not because I'm just mad, right, but because a disability justice practice, a healing justice practice requires us to start building out what it is we would like to see in replacement of harmful systems. So communication strategies, and I only have like three more minutes and then we're gonna get into q and I'm so excited. Um, so we want to be super honest about our capacity. That's true for everybody. If you are already stressed, it is not going to be helpful, right? So everyone has to be honest about capacity, um, right? And just because you don't have capacity today doesn't mean you won't tomorrow or next time, right? So it's not something we should ever feel ashamed about if we don't have it, um, but we have to be honest about it. I think a lot of conflict and a lot of heartache would probably be prevented if folks were just honest about what they were able to hold in a moment. Um, meeting folks where they're at, right? I think also what happens a lot is typical people might like see me walking down the street talking to myself and think that I'm in a crisis, right? Um, and maybe sometimes for some people, someone walking down, if they're walking down the street talking to themselves, that might be a sign of crisis. Um, this is how I move and communicate in the world, right? Uh, me pacing is not me being agitated. Me moving my hands or stimming is not me being aggressive. Uh, this is actually how I move in the world. Um, I am not coming for you. <laughs> um, so I think it's also important, again, to do some self-checking about our own internalized ableism and what we've been taught to assume about people who are moving in different ways, right? Um, and meeting them where they're at. If someone is not calling something a crisis, then why am I calling it a crisis is essentially a, a question I ask myself a lot. Um, honest and timely feedback is super important. Space to address dynamics and offer feedback because we're all going to fuck up during this. It, I don't care who you are. I don't know. I don't care how many books you've read. Nobody knows every single person's other trigger or what they've survived or everything they've gone through or their personal politics or right their cultural beliefs. Um, so we're all going to fuck up. And a part of the practice is how do we address those dynamics and how do we offer feedback lovingly? Um, don't only hang out in crisis. I noticed, I noticed this a lot too. Um, my ICAD team loves to karaoke. Um, we like going to the dance parties together when we have spoons, some of us. Um, you know, we like, we like playing video games. Uh, we do a lot of different things together. We, we like to have Zoom dinners together. We do social distance hangouts now still, right? So making sure you're not just focusing on uh, like crisis but also focusing on like joy, right? That's actually a really important thing for everybody's mental health and well-being is joy. Um, documentation is critical. Uh, people are constantly evolving. My, my, the ways that I navigate my disabilities and the way my disabilities have show up have changed a lot over the years, right? And so having documentation um, gives me perspective for when I may not be as grounded to understand that there is growth happening and also to see where I may need to do a little more digging or self work um, to, to work through some of my, my spirals and things. Um, we want communication to be grounded in self-determination and mindfulness whenever possible. Um, oh no, is it time to stop? I see you. Oh, it's a five-minute five uh, warning. Just oh, five-minute warning. Yay. Um, right. Again, clear boundaries. Non-punitive. Super important. Non-punitive is super important. Um, I know you all know that because you're abolitionists. Um, so another slide. This is quick. It'll You'll have this, but just like we, guess what? Uh, we're in it. Uh, this is going to be a difficult time. We have to have con difficult conversations with the people we love right now about what is going to happen in the event that something goes down and someone does end up in an, in an emotional crisis or a medical crisis, um, if somebody gets arrested, right? Um, 
we may not have control over the context and conditions right now, but we do have control over how we move, right? And that's very important to remember because it's very disempowering when we forget that, right? So we may be trying to impact like this whole world change, but that starts with how we're practicing like in our family right now. Right, in our chosen families, in our communities, in our, in our network. Um, so please take the time to talk to the folks in your life, right, and maybe come up with some worst case scenario plans. Um, you know, make sure you understand what each other's wishes are, what you do and do not consent to, um, right? Learning how to give real apologies. Um, for those of us who are, who are mad, right? Madness is not an excuse for abusive behavior. What are some of the ways that we are challenging, right? Or pushing ourselves to understand how we can mitigate and navigate, right? How our madness shows up. Um, I believe that Right, practicing gratitude and appreciation with each other is also a really critical thing. Um, everyone is holding a lot right now, right? And people are showing up in the best ways that we can. And we do have to offer that gratitude and appreciation for ourselves. And again, the gentle reminder that transformation takes time. We are unlearning a whole lot of part of my French bullshit, right? Um, a whole lot of bullshit about ourselves and each other and how the world is supposed to work. And that takes time. It's a lot to shake up. So we have to be very loving with each other as these transformation processes are, are, are happening. I'm not saying take shit. Like if someone is, you know, being abusive, I'm not saying take that, but I am saying that, right? We must understand that transformation takes time and we are in a long haul game right now. Um, and so, it's very important for us to start thinking about what these maps are that are gonna help guide uh, future generations into a world that does not require cages or view cages as, a, as an option, right, for anybody ever. Questions and thoughts. Thanks, team. Oh, well, thank you so much, Elliot. Um, so I guess what we can do for the Q&A, you can either send it in the chat or you can on chat just put stack and then I can call on people uh, as I see that. Um, but Elliot, the first question that we did receive was, um, I want to know how can we support someone who is experiencing a manic episodes? Right. Um, so mania is obviously a super tough one. I am someone who also experiences mania. Um, a lot of my practices personally have been um, a like exercise if that is an option for that person so like can we get this person to go for for walks with us uh, can we um, get them to do some some body movement right mania is like that hyper increase of energy um, scatteredness my team actually my team knows to take my credit cards um, when I get manic, because one of my things that I do is I'll just buy a bunch of really random stuff that is like absolutely not necessary, right? Um, but I think the way that, again, we want to think about this is um, we can't support someone who's manic, right? S there is a specific person experiencing mania. Um, do they ident identify what they're experiencing as mania, right? How would they describe what they're feeling and what, what thought processes they're in right now? Um, for a lot of people, mania can also be an incredibly creative and expressive time, right? I think a, a, a reason a lot of folks um, who have bipolar diagnoses like myself, that like the struggle with medication is because you're also shutting down, <laughs> right, some part that I actually need in order to, to move. So again, it's like meeting people where they're at, what are you experiencing, right? What is this feeling like? Like when people start moving into grandiose delusion, right, or when folks are start moving into um, like more of a fantasy realm, what I tend to do is I'm not invalidating someone. I need someone to trust me. That's what that person is experiencing in that moment. What I like to do is offer cho folks choices, right? So, and again, this is coming from like 
it makes more sense to move towards support if we've already had these conversations, right? Because if someone just comes in and is like, I'm taking your credit cards, that's, that's messed up, right? It's not consensual. Um, you really wanna be leaning into and encouraging the person you're supporting to, to name what's happening. And if they're getting to an escalated place, starting to offer options. I wish that I could say there were roving teams of mad folks who were down to come and chill with folks for as long as it takes for someone to come down. Um, but that is not where we're at yet. Right. But thinking about what it means to lovingly show up for someone, not invalidate an experience and try and get as much information from that person about where they're at in that moment so that when folks are, you know, back in the valley or wherever, then you can have that conversation with them. Right. And that's something that's been very helpful for me is um, my safety team reflecting back like this is what you were like, like this is what was happening. And I may not be able to hear that in the moment. Um, but afterwards, that's something that I do take into a part of my process of like, what is the healing work that I need to do? I hope that's helpful. Uh, thank you, Elliot. And we have another uh, question and comment. Um, Thank you, Elliot, for being vulnerable, open, and sharing your experiences. I am someone who wants to be available for those in my life in the crisis team. How can we approach this idea without causing harm to our loved ones? Mm. Here's, again, uh, the thing that I offer is that all of us have mental health. Um, the reason that most people feel safe talking to me or, you know, why I do this is because I was honest. Um, I don't care who you are, how you identify, uh, this is a fucking tough moment. If you see someone that needs support, uh, one of the first things you can do is be vulnerable yourself and be like, hey, I'm really struggling. I really love our friends. I want us to just come together and have a conversation about what we think our needs are individually and how we can support each other collectively right now. Um, because the point is it isn't just about this uh, one individual who may be having an episodic experience or an emotional experience, however they identify that. Um, but it's about all of us building a network that understands emotional crisis is inevitable for everybody, <laughs> that everyone will experience um, emotions and extremes and in different ways, and that we have to create space to, to figure out how to hold that um, that isn't just focused on like there's something wrong with you and so we want to have an intervention and tell you we want to do this right um, it is about the give and take it is about the mutuality that makes this process different right from a from a psychiatric process I hope that's helpful also email me if it's not helpful and we can chat more about it um, later for folks who are asking questions so I got two questions together um, one's a quicker thing of explaining kind of difference between an advanced directive and power of attorney yes and then the other was like how can we do this with the children in our lives yes um so a power of attorney so what happens and this almost happened to me uh so when you when you reach the age of consent if you're someone who's been um like you know chronically that you know chronically institutionalized or whatever um oftentimes what they'll do is uh, there's there's something called like a conservatorship right where um i no longer have the right uh to make medical or life decisions for myself uh though that is oftentimes passed on to family members sometimes nonprofits, and sometimes the state depending on the situation of the individual um for me the I have a power of attorney and proxies. Um, so the power of attorney is basically if there's a medical emergency or if I am uh, ever unconscious or whatever, uh, this person has my advance directive, which is essentially like, here's what I'm okay with happening if I'm ever unconscious and there's an emergency and I can't make a medical decision, um, right? It has the things like DNR, what types of treatments are okay. Um, for me as a trans person, I also very clearly name uh, that I would like to be referred to as Elliot and that I would like the pronouns he, him to be used um, because oftentimes that is not respected uh, for trans folks, right? Um, 
So it's, it's essentially having like my advanced directive is this is what I'm okay with. And then my power of attorney and proxies are the people who have the decision-making power to make that happen. And I'm sorry if I missed um, the second part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the advanced directive is, I just had to sign it today myself. The advanced directive is after like you're kind of on death door, like DNR, that kind of stuff, which is different from the power of attorney. Oh, so the other question, um, Elliot was the, um, uh, children, how we can do this with the children in our life. And I'll actually add another question to this to that just come up. And how do you do a safety team when you don't have any people around you that you feel safe with? Mm. Yes. Um, so safety planning with children. Um, there are like the, the things that I'll say, and especially as a, as a, someone who survived the system as a, as a child, right, as an adolescent too. Um, teach children about consent. Understand that um, you may be teaching your child one thing and the whole entire world might be teaching them something else about themselves um, or how power is supposed to look in their life. Um, I think we do a great disservice to children by not listening to them or believing them. Uh, and I think a lot of us would have been much better adults uh, if adults had listened to us um, and had heard us when we were children. Um, so I, I think the things that you can do is having conversations with children um, that is not, it doesn't have to be a scary thing, but even starting with like, what do we do with our anger? You know, when you feel angry, what does it look like? Like, does it taste like anything? Um, where do you feel it in your body, right? Um, what are okay ways to get rid of anger? You know, and what are ways that might be not okay or might hurt somebody to get rid of our anger, uh, right? And how do I communicate when I'm in that place? Um, even starting with just naming emotions in that type of way, I found um, when having conversations with children. And also, children learn the most from watching what we do. Uh, if you are not modeling, asking for care and support, and your child sees you burned out and stressed out, they're probably going to think that's what normal is, right? Um, so we also want to think about how our practice is, right? It isn't just what we say, it's what we do, and it's how we show up. Um, so really modeling what it is that, that we want to see and how we want children to understand how consent is practiced. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the, the last part of that question, comrade? How do you do, um, and there's kind of two questions that were together, so, and this might be kind of our last uh, question. Okay. But um, what, how do you do this if you don't have any people you feel safe with or you're just kind of used to relying on a couple of people? Right. That's totally real, and most of us spend most of our time in isolation, right? Um, and especially if we are people who are on wards currently. Um, I, I will say that like, part of what I had to do is really kind of put myself out there, right? I would start with those two people, right? And then once you're building with those two people, right, or that one person even, Right, you can start thinking about maybe I feel okay with this person not knowing everything, but maybe I feel okay with this person coming over to play video games and knowing that I'm having a hard day. Right, um, it's very important for in our boundaries practice, right, to not just throw all the trust in one basket, uh, of course, um, but you know, think about how much you can extend out. Um, and even if it's bit by bit and it's not like everything all at once, right, build that trust slowly. Um, and also online relationships are valid relationships, right, and especially now during the era of COVID-19 um, that we, we also need to really, um, I just want to lift up, right, that there's so many support group spaces and places where mad folks are gathering, like on the Fireweed Collective, uh, pages, there's right Trans Lifeline, there's so many different places that are sort of gathering where folks can share ideas, uh, checking out Mad in America. And I have a whole resource list with different links that are already linked through for y'all to kind of peruse through on your own time. Um, but I strongly encourage finding 
your DJ community. Um, and, I, and I think as a, as a MAD person, it took me a long time to understand that I'm actually a part of a community and that I'm a part of a, a lineage um, and that um, I don't need to be ashamed or, or hide from my own people. Um, and we're out here, so yeah. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Elliot. I just wanted to share that everybody was saying what you're saying was great. You, they've learned a lot and really appreciate, and they feel like they're going to really be able to apply this in a number of contexts. Everyone is expressing how grateful they are for everything that you have shared with us today. Um, was there anything you wanted to close with? And did you want to do that before we kind of give our last announcements um, or after? Or? Right. So the, you will be getting all of this shortly and it has sort of all of the different pieces that have, have been influences in, in our lives. If you have more questions or you need support talking more about safety planning, um, that is something that I do and I never, I don't charge, um, so if you, if you need a hand, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and I also have HALA safety planning templates for different scenarios and situations um, and other like thoughts about abolition and the relationship between psychiatry on madqueer.org. Um, and yeah, I'm always open to feedback and I'd, I'd love to hear from other mad folks who are, who are negotiating this and figuring this out. So. Thank you all for your time today. I deeply appreciate it. And if you'd like to be involved as we develop alternatives to 911 in Southern California and gradually take over the world and end carceral uh, ridiculousness, um, feel free to contact us and just let us know what you'd be interested in. Uh, we're starting teams in different geographic areas. So if there's an area you want to work with, let us know and we can connect you with other people in that area. Or if you want to work in a specific kind of issue or uh, community, let us know and we can kind of connect you. We'll have a website up in about a couple weeks where we'll have forums where you can connect with each other and brainstorm and problem solve and all these things that we're trying to figure out uh, together. Um, so I sent a little link about 5 million times. If you want to be on the list server, better if you could do that there so we don't have to go through the thousand emails that currently exist in our uh, web page so we can just directly create a, a, a excel sheet from that but if you have more than that if you just want to do more than be on the listserv and you want to get involved in something just email us and just say what, what you'd like to do and we'll get you connected and ready to end global oppression so without further ado everyone on the listserv will uh, get a copy i already i put them on the um, link but if you had trouble accessing it i'll send to the listserv the recording link, the transcript, and the handout. So you'll get all these different things. So thank you so much, Elliot. This is just fabulous and wonderful and so helpful. And we'll, we hope that we will keep your work going in this area. Everyone.